episode 103 with my marvelous mapped team lady in red rachel grubbs mapped co-founder how are you doing today i am excellent very glad to be here love this part of my week yes yes here to help every pre-med student out in the universe um so answer answer questions ask questions do whatever we want to do Verinia granham Yes, yes. Wearing your pre-med element shirt, 528, 3, 365, 247, 247, right? right? Um, yeah. Former assistant dean in the pre-health and STEM advising at Hofstra University. Hanging out, answering questions. It is it is yeah. uh, busy application season. What yeah, are the, the students that you're working with right now? Mm -hmm. What are they dealing with? What what stresses are they going through right now? Oh, oh man, should I apply now? Um, I you know I have a later MCAT date. Should I wait? Should I wait for my score? <laughs> all of it. Ooh, all of it. All of it. All of it. Uh, but it's all um, good. Yes, it is all good. Verinia, mm -hmm. in your mic settings, uh, your mic is coming through your webcam or your computer. You can check that. Okay. And then the man, Hi. the myth, <laughs> the legend. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I think that's how we should talk. A really big eyes, like, hello. <laughs> Former director of admissions at UT Southwestern, retired executive director at TMDSAS, Dr. Scott. Right, everyone. Woo! Crowd goes wild. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yes. yes. You um, clearly don't know me very well. <laughs> yes. Yes, that is true. Um, that's okay. They uh, they they know what they know. They know, and uh, you are an amazing person oh. to be helping all of these students out in the world. And uh, for the next few weeks, um, you will hold the title of only former director of admissions on our team but that will change uh, as we add a another former director correct. of admissions on That's our correct. team so excited to announce that soon in the next few weeks um yep. but enough about I'm us excited about that yeah we're here for you um so ask your questions go to mapped.tv that's where we pull most of our questions and uh and ask them there and we'll answer them here that's the goal let's rock and roll i'm a poet didn't even know it galberto hello i'm taking the mcst whatever that is i must maybe it's related to the mcat uh, in july i'm having a hard time getting recommendations from professors can i submit my application without the letters and up the upload them later just to get verified. Yes, letters are one thing that um, you can update post submission. Um, it's bad that you're having a hard time getting letters at this point in the game. So, chop chop. Yep. <laughs> Get to it. Yes, yes. Cade asks, what is the best way to gain clinical experience doing, during these times? I'm assuming COVID times. It seems like it's almost impossible unless you have connections. Yeah, Verinia. Yeah. What, what should students be doing to try to get some, some exposure these days? You know, you might want to broaden your horizon a little bit more. Um, just um, maybe you're just narrowing your your choices to maybe hospitals or clinics, you can look at, you know, elsewhere, look at nursing homes, look at, you know, hospice facilities. Um, there's, there's opportunities, you might have to travel a little farther, you might have to go out, you know, a little farther outside of your area to find these opportunities. It is harder, it is hard, I should say, um, but things are opening up slowly, post COVID. Um, but you got to be persistent, just keep looking, keep looking, it doesn't have to be a paid position, it doesn't have to be, um, something full-time, right? It can be a part-time volunteer position. Um, but maybe uh, think of it that way. Think about maybe broadening your um, horizons a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Expand that search radius, as they yep. say. There you go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Awesome. Yes, sir. Asks, I'm going to be my first semester yeah. uh, in going – into my first semester of undergrad this fall as a pre-med. Do you have any tips for me in terms of my first year grades, extracurriculars, research, et cetera? Rachel, we talked to lots of bright-eyed, bushy-tailed pre-med students who tend to do too much. Exactly. Thoughts there? Yeah. yeah. So, yes, here I love that you're 
you're asking this now that you're planning ahead. That's great. Your number one job for your first semester and maybe your first year of undergrad is just to take the required courses and get as close to perfect A's as possible, right? Um, you might get some B's, you might get a C here or there. It, it happens, it's not the end of the world, but you need to learn how to study like a college student, which is very different than studying like a high school student. And you need to learn to be able to be successful at the very rapid race that STEM happens, right? So science and math in college feels wicked fast after high school. Um, so you just have to, to learn how to hang on and use your resources, right? So you're going to lecture, of course, but you're also going to office hours. You're going to TA sessions. You're finding out if there's a math student center or a science student center, and you're taking advantage of that at your campus, like all those resources. Once you get a hang on all that and you feel like, okay, now I can do it. I know how to get mostly A's. I know how to use all the resources. I haven't just relied on study skills that worked in the past. I built new study skills. Then I think it's a good idea to start dipping your toe into clinical experience and shadowing. Um, because I do think that the earlier you start that, the better. And I think it's just good to do clinical and shadowing slow and steady throughout college. But, but first comes grades. First comes marriage. Oh, wait, no. First comes love. Then comes marriage. Then comes baby in the baby carriage. That's one way to do it. <laughs> First come grades. Then come. We need, we need to figure out a pre-med version of that song. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Natalie, uh, volunteering as a medical interpreter count as clinical experience? Should I scribe instead? I feel it does because I interact with the patients, but I do not know. See, si. see, si, Natalie. It does. It's a good experience. Yep. Yeah, great experience. Alex, I am an accounting major. Should I mention this in my personal statement or let my transcripts tell? I've received mixed signals from different advisors. Scott, what is the goal of the personal statement? Why do you want to go to medical school? Mm. So I am an accounting major. Therefore, I want to be a doctor. That sounds like a good story. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I think it would depend a little bit on the context uh, within yeah. the personal statement of why you mentioned that. If it's just sort of an aside, then, you know, I, or if you were, you know, kind of talking about maybe you were in business, you know, as an accounting major and then you switched over or, you know, and you're sort of telling that story of, of when you became interested in medicine and that, you know, part of that is this switch over or, or I don't know. So, but in general, I would say, yeah, it's not something that you sh would normally mention in your personal statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why, why, why do you want to be a doctor? That is yep. the goal. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not a timeline. It's not a resume. Right. Why do you want to be a doctor? Yep. RM. I started a and a P this summer. My body crashed and stopped functioning. Should I drop it? My professor is working with me on deadlines, but I'm at zero function. Uh, I'm sorry, RM, that you're struggling. Uh, yeah. First, the, the only thing that matters for everyone at any point in this game is your health. Take care Without your health, yeah. you can't help anyone else. Yeah. Um, I, I, I always, my, my wife always yells at me. We went to med school together and I would always get mad at her. And she still does it to this day where she'll come home at night and be like, I haven't eaten anything. I'm like, what do you mean you haven't eaten anything all day long? Like I, I sometimes fast all day long, but I am still functioning. Obviously, everyone's different. She gets a little crazy when she doesn't eat all day long. And she just runs herself ragged. And she's always, always, always doing for others. And I'm like, y y you have to take care of yourself first and foremost. So my motto is always food comes first. Um, e even in the hospital, like, I need to eat. And the patients are going to be in their, their bed. They're not going anywhere. Um, so, yeah, drop drop the class. That's not, a, yes, not an issue. Absolutely. <laughs> James Dowd, any recommendations regarding Casper and the AAMC preview test? And when should these be done by if submitting my applications this week? Verinia, Casper, AAMC preview, these situational judgment tests mm -hmm. that uh, seem like they 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 keep um, 
uh, like like the little gremlins. You put a little water on them. They keep uh, <laughs> like multiplying. multiplying. <laughs> yes. Um, what, mm-hmm. What's what's some good information here for James? Um, James, now would be a good time to start looking into it. Now registering for it. Um, the preview test, I think the first date is later on in June. Um, but Casper, you have some some earlier dates. Um, but it's part of it's sort of part of your secondary process, uh, the secondary essay process, right? You just want to have it done, have the score in. It takes about three weeks to get your score uh, around the same time that you know schools are starting to receive your um, application and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think now now would be a good time to start looking into that right, and registering for it. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Shani, Shani, foreshadowing descriptions. Is it better to write doctor's name and specialty or specialty and specific things you observed? AKA cardiovascular surgeon. I saw a cabbage clinic rounds, etc. Thank you. So super generic, right? Shadowing, you're gonna obviously very you're gonna see very specialty specific things with each specialty. It's talking about what you saw isn't super impactful. It's going to be like, well, duh, with a cardiovascular surgeon, you saw a cabbage. Wonderful. Great. Um, so foreshadowing stuff, you, you really just need to list names and specialties, um, hours, maybe date ranges. Just depends on how much space you have, how many physicians you've shadowed. So don't overthink it. Do what works. Just do what you think works best there. So for those in the audience that don't know what cabbage is, I have this image of coleslaw. So (laughs) what does cabbage mean? Uh, A coronary artery bypass graft. Okay. Just so, just so we're all on the same page. Also known as cabbage. Okay. (laughs) Nom, 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 nom. So it has nothing to do with coleslaw. Nothing to do with coleslaw. coleslaw. (laughs) Which actually raises a good point. So this is sort of tangential to what Shani asked, whether it's in, talking about specialties or more likely talking about your clinical experiences, write for a wide audience because some people reading your essays may have MDs. A lot of people in admissions have PhDs in education. So, um, you know, I always say, write Like you're talking to an English professor you really like, you know, they're bright, you know, they're well-educated, right? You're not talking down to them, but they may not have the same information that you have. Correct. Um, So, Wider audience. Yep. Get rid of the jargon. No medical speak. Yes. Yahi. Yahia. Does clinical experience have to be in a clinic or can it be on campus through helping students in isolation due to COVID? Rachel, is it <laughs> clinical? <laughs> Uh, I think I put this banner up already. I'm going to give Yahia the benefit of the doubt that they asked that question before I did this five minutes ago. Clinical does not have to be in a clinic. So what makes something clinical? It is clinical if you are interacting with the patient in a way directly related to their health. So if you work at an ER and your whole job is to walk around with a clipboard and take names, not clinical. If you work at a hospice and your job is to sit with dying patients and answer their final needs and make sure they're not in pain, that's clinical, even if you're doing hospice in their home. Mm -hmm. Um, So location is not the key part. It's the activity. Yeah, And, and care does not equal hands-on poking prodding doing mm-hmm. all the stuff it's just right care is being there caring mm-hmm. for them mm-hmm. yep yep galberto i'm an emt with lots of experience where specifically can i add that in my application would be under the why i want to go to med school section i'm not exactly sure so <sighs> Uh, I, I'm going to hand it off because <laughs> uh, I'm going to say something that I shouldn't say. Uh, Verinia, <laughs> <laughs> it's for you. Sure. Um, so this is an activity, obviously, that's taking up huge chunks of your time. Um, you can, of course, include that in your activity section. You could potentially use some of those experiences to reflect on as you're writing your personal statement, right? It's part of your story, part of why you want to go to medical school is maybe some interactions that you've had with patients that showed you why, why medicine, right? It's shown you why you want to do this, why you want to um, dedicate your life to this career. So it, it can go in both places. It just can't, like your whole personal statement shouldn't just be about why 
you don't want to be an EMT anymore, why you want to be a doctor. It's just another activity to reflect on that showed you why medicine. Yep. Yeah. And I'll add to that. So, uh, uh, Guabelto, I hope I'm saying it correctly. Uh, it sounds like you've got some kind of um, underlying fundamental knowledge that you need to catch up on a little bit, especially if you're applying this year. So I definitely recommend, even if you're not ready to apply yet, you need to go open your AMCAS account, just create that application and start looking through all the stuff they're going to ask you. Um, and then um, we've got on the same channel that you're watching today on YouTube, we've got lots and lots of free videos about how to approach the personal statement, how to approach activities. Um, you're still welcome to ask questions here, but I think you're going to really benefit from spending half or an hour or an hour just catching yourself up on what this system is like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, spotlight Ryan. And also, Ryan has a book, The Medical School Application Process. It's a pre-med playbook series. And this one takes you through all of your years of being a pre-med. Yes. <laughs> yes. Go check that out. All right. Betterog, any advice on juggling three application systems, TMDSAS, Comus, and AMCAS? <sighs> Dr. Scott Wright. Um, yes. Luckily, a Comus <clears throat> and AMCAS are very similar. Personal statements are the same length. Activity descriptions are almost the same length. Not not a ton of difference there. TMDSAS, very different. Yes. What are your thoughts on how students should tackle this step by step? So my suggestion of that, and, and I'm going to make some assumptions here. Uh, if you're applying to TMDSAS, I think that the chances are, Betts Rog, you're a Texas resident. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that all applicants to Texas schools are Texas residents, but a a, a giant portion of them are. If you're a Texas resident, your best chance of getting into medical school is going to be in Texas, uh, just because of the uh, of the residency, you know, requirements of the schools and stuff like that. Um, so, I my suggestion is for Texas residents that are applying to TMDSS, do that one first. Uh, do AMCAS second because the uh, of the you know, you want to be in on the early uh, stages of the application process sometime in June is what we typically suggest. And then do ACOMAS because there is a slight um, difference in the timeline for the for the uh, osteopathic medical schools. They they often go deeper into the spring uh, in, in uh, interviewing and uh, and. Uh, you know, making offers and, and stuff like that. So, so that's my suggestion in terms of the progress. I, I think you tackle one at a time, you, you do, you get one done, you submit it, you get the next one done, submit it. That's not to say that you're not working on all of them at the same time as well. But I think uh, if you, if you do it in that, in that way, that can be helpful. Tara asks, if I mark planning on retaking the MCAT on my application, does that make schools look at me differently? I don't want to be a default wait list because they're waiting for a new score. I think Tara uh, messaged me on Instagram with this question. Um, if, if you mark that you're planning on retaking the MCAT, then you mark that you're retaking the MCAT. And it doesn't matter what schools are going to do. Uh, if you need to retake the MCAT, then retake the MCAT. Right. Yep. Plain, plain and simple. Right. Mm -hmm. Nuts and bolts. Oh, hold on, Veronica. <laughs> too fast. Nuts and nuts and bolts um, is, yeah, most schools will typically wait until that new score comes in. They'll see that you've flagged your application as a, a score pending and they will. Thankfully, this is a good thing. Not judge you on the score that you have because you're retaking the test and they'll wait for that new score to come in and then look at at everything. So. Agreed. It, yeah. it, it's not a default wait list. It's a default. We're going to wait to to look at your application. Pen, pending. Yeah. Pending. Yeah. I mean, another way to think of it is you can't have it both ways. Yeah. You can't both retake your MCAT and get an early look, right? They either look at you early with your current MCAT because you're not retaking it 
or you're retaking it and then they're going to wait. Those are your choices. So. Yep. 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 Um, what, one other quick thing uh, I forgot to mention Yasser earlier on asked this question. Um, I think Yasser would be an amazing person to give, give a, a free Ooh. year of mapped pro to someone who's entering their first semester of undergrad. Agreed. I agree with that. So Yasser, if you're still watching, hopefully maybe email info at mapped.com and we'll, uh, we'll get you situated. Cool. Yeah, yep. that's a great idea. Jacqueline, as someone who's had a fluctuating GPA trend, would it be best to enroll in a post back program or retake the courses that were below a C or go into a master's program for pre-medical students? So, Verinia, um, the dreaded post back versus SMP versus something else versus mm -hmm. what 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 is the best route for a student if there is a best? Yeah, I mean, it. it it depends on your situation. Obviously, we don't know what your GPA trend is, um, but post back programs are undergraduate courses, and medical schools are going to look at your undergraduate um, record, and you know, see if you're able to handle the course load, see if you're able to handle the rigors, the rigor of that curriculum. Um, so, post back program is sort of the first stop, the first place to go to if you feel like you need some grade repair um, or if you just want to kind of take some more upper level sciences to show you're uh, capable of handling that uh, workload and continue, maybe establish an, a, a sort of an upward trend and continue that upward trend. That's always preferable to preferable to the master's program. The master's program, I mean, if you want to do a master's and do a master's because you want to do the master's, as far as grade repair, um, it, it really, um, we, a post back program is the best way to go. Yes, yes. Rachel, hello, the artsy men. Uh, love the two red shirts versus two blue shirts <laughs> vibe y'all go, uh, going on. Yes. Yeah, I decided after the fact, after I saw it, that we were pre celebrating Flag Day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, where, where I grew up in Southern California, we wouldn't be wearing these, but, um, that's a whole different story. I thought about that. I was like, I'm not making that joke. <laughs> I, I grew up there. So I'll make that joke. We, we, we definitely had a list of things that we shouldn't wear colors wise, shouldn't wear brand wise, shouldn't wear. Um, but that's, uh, that's just life. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. Latasha, I decided not to apply this cycle. Should I continue to tweak my personal statement throughout my gap year? Just leave it for next cycle. Latasha, are you happy with your personal statement? <laughs> and do you not think maybe that life will happen to you this year and you may have some new experiences that you would want to reflect on and you'll grow as a person over this next year? So yeah. As the great, I don't know, said, um, Art is never finished. It just stops in interesting places. So don't let yours stop here. Keep tweaking. Keep working. Yep. Agreed. Amy asks, I'm taking the MCAT in two weeks for the fourth time. Current average full length is a 507. Great. Last scores were sub 500, and I rushed retakes. Always a big mistake. Yeah. Recently, I got into an SMP, but GPA is a 3.4, so I don't need it, but it offers a guaranteed interview. Thoughts? So, Dr. Wright. Yes. SMPs, $30,000, dollars mm -hmm. for one guaranteed interview. Is that mm -hmm. worth it? Is that worth <laughs> that much money? Mm, I, I would. S and P's are typically pretty expensive, and uh, you know, depending on where you go around the country. But I would say, in large part, they're they're not cheap, and yeah. uh, so I, I that's a stretch for me uh, to think about that in terms of that being the the only reason you're doing an S and P. So I yeah. agree with that. Um, so I, I would say, you know, that that I. If you're wanting to do a little GPA repair, 3.4 is not a bad GPA. Um, so I, I don't know, you know, I, I would prefer if you want to do some additional coursework, just do it at your local university and, uh, and, 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 you know, let that stand uh, on its own. It sounds to me like the real, 
issue here for you, uh, Amy, is the MCAT. And uh, so I, I, you know, good luck in two weeks. I really, uh, you know, hope, hope things go well for you. And, um, you know, but that that's, you know, sounds to me like that's kind of where the, where the, it, it, or at least some of the issues are based on what you said in this question. Yeah. And, and 3.4, we don't know what those trends are. So okay. it's hard to give full advice right. there. Right. Um, but hopefully a good, good upward trend with that 3.4 definitely will help as well. Yeah. Yeah. Emmanuel, what advice do you have regarding classes that I took for a pass fail instead of letter grade during the pandemic? Should I retake the classes even though I passed them at a community college or do a post back program? So this is a hard one, right? Because every medical school is going to have different policies in terms mm -hmm. of when did you take them pass fail? Was it that first semester in that spring where kind of lots of schools forced pass fail onto students, maybe into the fall where it was still a little bit more accepted pass fail? Or was it spring of 2021 and you were like, yeah, I'll still take it pass fail. Um, but schools potentially med schools potentially are going to be be a little bit less likely to be okay with those so it's going to be a school to school um unfortunately decision on when they'll accept to pass fail but i think i think the 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 broad advice is that med schools are going to be accepting pass fail especially for prereqs especially during that spring 2020 semester yep and so and summer that that summer if it was a summer class yeah yeah. Kelsey, I own slash operate a business and I decided to pursue medicine this year. Would medical schools consider that as an extracurricular? I don't want it to appear as stiff. I'm likely overthinking it um, a thousand percent. So the extracurricular section is it's it's colloquially. I don't know if that's the right word for that. Right. We generally call it the extracurricular section. It really is the activity section. It's the what have you been doing with your life section? Mm -hmm. And owning a business, a thousand percent should go in there. Absolutely. Yeah, I think on AMCAS, it's actually called work slash activities. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Low, L-O. I'm a non-trad and I'm so overwhelmed by the whole process. Welcome to the club. You are not alone. Yeah, yeah. On a tight budget. So I've watched all your videos. Great. That's why we put them out there. Who should I allow in my life to review my personal statement and see if it tells a proper story? Oh, that's so a good question. Great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Great is. question. Yeah. So Verinia, yeah. right? It's it's uh this like protected thing. I'm like, I'm I'm putting myself out here in this yeah. essay, this personal statement. And I want to give it to someone, Rachel, as you say, right? Someone who respects me more than loves me to give me some, some good feedback. Yep. And they should ideally kind of understand what the whole goal of the personal statement yep. is. How should Low here find out who to send it to? Yeah. Um, so a great way to think of it is who maybe not to give it to to read. <laughs> your parents, your significant others, <laughs> your kids, um, because they know you very well, and they're they're not they're they'll they'll be afraid to tell you the truth if if it's not hitting the mark. Um, exchange it. I don't know if you're around other pre meds. Um, there's a Facebook group that we are part of that that's really se seems really supportive. There's some some exchanges that happen there if you want um, unbiased feedback. Uh, any pre-health advisors that you may have in your life or um, someone who knows your journey, who knows that you're applying to medical school. Um, but you definitely want someone who is going to give you honest, straight up feedback that they're not going to hold back or be afraid to tell you the truth about it. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Fun. And I, I would add to that, that I think it should be a small number of people. Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, I, you mm -hmm. know, I, I've had students who are letting like, 15, 20 people yeah. look at the, in, in that is way too many people. Mm -hmm. You're going to yeah. get way too mm -hmm. many opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, so just make it a small number, people that you trust, just like Vrenia said, uh, people who will, you know, give you the, the real down low on what, what yeah. uh, are the low down? I guess it's the down low. 
the lowdown. The lowdown. The lowdown. lowdown. <laughs> yes. Lowdown. Yes. Uh, and, and to that point, right? I um, when I was writing my my personal statement book, this one, um, the uh, I I reached out to the director of admissions at NYU, who who I'm I'm friendly with, and asked him for a quote on the importance of a personal statement. And he actually wrote me back. He's like, I'm not sure I'm the best person for that because we actually don't like personal statements here because most of them are pretty trash. He's <laughs> like, what we have found is that personal statements, students are getting too much advice, um, too, too much input to your point, Scott. And they are village statements, not personal statements. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah, you definitely yeah. want to write it by committee. Yeah. Right? It, it should sound like you, not the 20 people who advise you. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Some would say that I am. <laughs> uh, Jamie asks, for a comus, there's an optional COVID essay. Is it bad to not do it? I was fortunate enough to not be heavily impacted other than some online classes and pursu pursuing virtual ECs. Same as many people. Rachel, a lot of this process, we uh, we will say optional is required, um, yeah. especially for TMD SAS. The optional essay is like, yeah, you should probably still do it. Yeah. Uh, the COVID essay, Jamie, fortunately, sounds like wasn't super impacted, but potentially still has something to say. Yeah. I mean, I think any time because you get such a short amount of characters to tell your story. So anytime the application is giving you space to show them who you are. Um, authenticity is rare in these applications and it really shines through, you know, even, even as someone who helps, right? Like I, I review essays before they go to the ad comms and, you know, I'll see a lot of good ones and then I'll stumble upon an excellent one. And it just like stays with me all week, you know? So anytime you can really just be yourself and be authentic, it's great. Where I have seen a lot of people worry about COVID and I think correctly is you don't want this to sound like excuses. Like you don't have to be like at my school, it even closed down and then classes were online. Like, no, you don't say that happened to you too. <laughs> it happened to all of us. Right. So you don't want to make it. You never want to be negative. You don't want to be whining or making excuses. But if you have a thing, like I had never learned online before, so I had to build different study skills or I had to learn about, you know, how to take advantage of office hours when they weren't in person. Like if there's something that changed the way you learned, you you could talk about that. I think that's great. Um, yeah, just uh, you're right. It's it's going to be a common thing. So it doesn't have to be just for the kid who got kicked out of the dorm and whose home is in Somalia and didn't have a plane ticket to go home for two months. Like it doesn't have to be that extreme. Um, just just tell your story. Yep. Amy asks, I recently graduated and I need to retake two classes and I haven't taken the MCAT yet because I'm taking two gap years. I was not sure if I should do the MCAT or retake the classes first. Karinia, what are your thoughts? Definitely want to retake those classes first. Uh, remember, your MCAT is good for three years. So if you're not applying for another two cycles, let's say, that's sort of, you know, you're you're not going to be able to use that score beyond that third cycle. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and just the, this, the idea of um, retaking the classes, maybe it's content that you want to review for the MCAT itself as well. Um, so focus on that first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Lamia? Lamia? Uh, what is the best way to include conference presentation in our activities? I was first author and was wondering if I need to include all the other authors because of the character limits. Nope. No rules. Just do what works. Do what fits. Juliana, some of my extracurriculars are related to reproductive justice slash abortion. Could this be a red flag in my application? How do you recommend I talk about this in my activities section? So uh, I, I think this question, uh, especially right now, as we're awaiting <laughs> the release of, of the Supreme Court's uh, kind of June decisions, um, is potentially a hot topic. 
Um, but at the end of the day, Scott, we always talk about students need to tell their story. They need to be who they are. Yeah. Um, you don't want to be in a situation where you end up at a school that because you left this off an application and you show up and you're like, oh, they are like super anti everything I believe here. Um, you're not going to be happy for four years. Right. And luckily, most places of higher education potentially are a little bit more liberal and are OK with you talking about this kind of stuff. Scott, what do you recommend uh, for a student for this specific situation or any potential red flags that they may be wanting to talk about on an application, but they're concerned? Yeah, I, I do think you have to take care and and talk about it in, in you know, don't be dogmatic, uh, mm -hmm. number one, don't be negative, and uh, talk about it in terms of what your uh, values are and uh, what, these mean to you in terms of these activities now in this particular case you said some of my extracurriculars are rated are, are related to these things and so in you know i definitely would suggest that you include them in your activity list uh, this is an important part of who you are and uh, I, I'm assuming and uh, that this, you know, I, I completely agree with what uh, what Dr. Gray has said and that, you know, you you can't um, subtract from who you are because you're afraid it's going to offend somebody. Uh, you've got to really be you be you. If if they get offended, that's on them. And I agree completely. If if it's a red flag enough that they're going to not want you in their medical school because simply of that thing, then is that a place that you really want to be? So I, I agree with that completely. Yeah. Vehement nodding over here. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, thoughts on an unbalanced MCAT score? I did really well in cars, bio, and psych, but poorly on chem fizz, a 124. 512 overall. Do you recommend I address this in my secondaries? MCAT Rachel, uh, not a Rachel question asker. Uh, this unbalanced MCAT score fear that students have. Yeah. Too much, too much SDN in Reddit or a, a real concern here? Yeah. I, um, yeah, I think it's a myth. There, there used to be a lot of chatter about it, especially like a long time ago with the old MCAT that was um, three sections because the test had two very science heavy sections and then what they called back then verbal reasoning they used to talk about like they'd rather see um three tens than a 12 12 and a seven in verbal so there 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 was this idea that like man one low section score score especially if it was what is now cars could kill you so i understand why it's out there because it was considered good advice, but this is the thing about being a pre-med. It's why you need folks like us. It changes all the time. You got to stay current. And, um, you know, currently most ad comms, because the test is so reading heavy, because there's reading skills and scientific inquiry skills and critical reading skills on all four sections of the test, most ad comms seem mostly to look at the composite score. And if you have one real low score, maybe like real low, like a 118, 119, like the bottom of the scale. And maybe you have grades that correlate, right? So if you got, you know, an F in your English classes and then had to retake them to scrape into a C and you had a 118, I might just worry about whether or not you're fluent enough to practice medicine in the United States, right? But a 124 on cars, that's one point below the average. Like probably no one's even going to notice. So no, don't recommend, don't address it in your secondaries unless you get a secondary that says, hey, if you had an MCAT with an uneven section, I want to hear about it. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, do not try to force an agenda in. Yep. yep. That agenda. Halina, what is the last date I should submit my primary application in order to still be considered early? June 15th? Question mark? <laughs> Scott, um, what what is this considered? Like we talk all the time about submit yes. early, submit early, submit early. Is, is there like some label that goes onto an application that's like, ooh, considered early? No, no, no. And and I think you know they're going to know when you submitted it, even if that's interesting to them. I mean, so, on occasion, I would look at you know when the submission date was, and 
uh, particularly if there were problems with the application and I saw that the submission date was in September or something, then I might be like, oh, well, you know, okay. But beyond that, I think when, when, you know, when we talk about early, there's no, there's no, you know, notion in the admissions committee. There's a lot of admissions committee members that aren't even going to know when it was submitted uh, yep. anyway. I I think that uh, June fifteenth is fine. I I actually think that uh, really any time in the month of June is is probably going to be fine. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's less a kind of judgment of ooh you're not early, ooh you're early, mm -hmm. but more so just technicality. Like ooh we don't have a lot of seats left. Mm -hmm. Do we want to give you an interview spot for right. one of those seats? Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. That's all. The way I see it, it's like a window, right? In the summer, in June, you have a nice, wide open window. By September, <laughs> October, you're closing that window. Oh, it's like, all right, right, all right. So it's it's like um, it's like Indiana Jones, and he's running, trying to get out, and in that big rock door is sliding down, yeah. and and at the start, it's yeah. it's beginning, it's May and June, and then mm -hmm. at the very end, when he just barely makes it through and reaches his hand back through and grabs his hat. Like that's uh, that's getting a little bit later, maybe August, September ish. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's good. There you go. Sabine, when is a good time to start sending update letters to schools? I have some grades coming in throughout the summer, but not all together. Should I only send one letter or multiple? So this varies a little bit, right? TMDSAS, you have a little bit of fluctuation with grades. I believe a Comus as well, you can add grades. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are some windows where you can add grades to a Comus. AMCAS does not let you add grades. Not every school accepts update letters. Right. So, uh, Sabine, I would go and err on the fewer side. Uh, don't bother the schools. They're busy. <laughs> the admissions committees uh, are, are neck deep in, in applications. So um, the fewer, the better. And it's usually not grades that are going to make the difference. Be like, mm -hmm. oh, thanks for that update on, on your uh, physiology class. Um, yeah. Unless you have some really big red flags that you're hoping to, to uncover or get out of. Mm -hmm. Ahmed, I went to a community college and earned my associates, then transferred and earned my bachelor's. Is there an issue in having two of my recommendation letters written by community college professors? I don't think so. No? Mm -mm. No? Do they know you? That's yeah. the key. Can they write a good letter? That's the key. Yeah. Always go over uh, who knows you. Go with who knows you the best, who can write the best letter over title, prestige, etc. Yeah, absolutely. Brenna, when do you, what do you think about for-profit med schools? <laughs> so this is a good question. This comes <laughs> up a, a bunch. Um, the Caribbean has given a, a bad rap to for-profit med schools. We have several for-profit for med schools in the U.S. Most of them are DO schools, but not all. Um, for-profit doesn't equal evil. Right. We we have nonprofit entities in our ecosystem that are more evil than some of the for profit medical schools uh, yep. out there. So yep. um, Rocky Vista right near me is a great medical school. That's a for profit school. Um, so they're fine. Yeah. Uh, Arashi. Um, I'm worried about being repetitive between my primary and secondaries. For example, one of them says to discuss my most meaningful medical experiences. What if I already wrote about that in my primary? This is always a big concern when secondaries come out and they're like, uh oh, they're asking for the same information. What do I do? Um, unless the secondary specifically says, please don't repeat any information in your primary application. I wouldn't copy paste, but you're probably going to have some overlap in what you talk mm -hmm. about. It's just true. Yes, yes. Yeah. And it's always a, a confusing one because, I, and I know that secondary, it says the most meaningful medical experiences, which I always point to when I, I'm like, the primary most meaningful are not specifically talking about medical experiences that are most meaningful. It's just most meaningful experiences 
in, in your general. life mm-hmm. in general. So like I saw a, um, I was looking at an application the other day, somebody has a bearded dragon like, as a pet and he marked that as most meaningful. Mm-hmm. Like, great. Cool. Let's talk about it. <laughs> I saw that one too. <laughs> yep. And you know, as a, and let me just say as a former medical school admissions committee person and, and interviewer if i saw that in an inter, in a uh, in an application about the bearded dragon as an interviewer if depending on if it was a non-structured interview i would want to talk about that yeah, heck yeah tell me about this yeah you know, what, what's this all i don't i don't even know what a bearded dragon is you know let's talk oh, about so this I, I mean that i would center in on that from the very beginning you yeah know? me too so <laughs> Yep. Yeah. That's that's the really joy. And, and that's like our big mission and philosophy here is to get students comfortable telling their personal story and not forcing this like, oh, they have to know this. Medical schools want to know this. And so I have to do that. And and there's there's no really big have to's here. Tell your story, show who you are and let that personality and passion come through. Absolutely. And and if you have a bearded dragon, it's a big part of your life. Great. Obviously, if you're like doing some shady f- felonious stuff, <laughs> uh, if felonious felony, uh, if, if you're uh, like one of your hobbies is a felony, like maybe don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really cool. I want to talk about it. No, no. <laughs> McKenna, if we are anticipating an MCAT retake to come back later, should we submit prior to the score release? and get secondaries completed. So this is uh, one that always is a, uh, a game. Do I, do I submit? Do I add schools? Do I wait? Rachel, what are your thoughts here? Well, McKenna and I talked about this offline already, so I think she wants additional opinions. <laughs> Cheating. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> Perinia, what are your thoughts? <laughs> um, yeah, it's always best to submit earlier, right? Submit. Yep wait for your score submit to one school that you're comfortable with that you know you would go to if you were accepted um get your secondaries done yes definitely pre-write your secondaries um to at least get through the process of getting verified you can always add on more schools later yep yeah Mm -hmm. so it's one part of the process again Mm -hmm. that you can fix change Mm -hmm. after submission is adding new Mm -hmm. schools um, I, I had an interesting question that I didn't specifically know the answer to. Maybe one of you know the answer. If a student is an FAP recipient, they were asking, do they have to use all 20 schools on the initial submission or can they play this one submission game, add schools later? I tried finding it from the AAMC. I didn't see anything in the FAQs. My assumption is, that it's up to 20 schools no matter what. You submit to one school, you can add 19 later. Uh, I don't know if you, if either any of you knew uh, yeah. specifically and, and the right answer. I saw that question. I don't know the answer to it either. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, yeah, I don't know if it's all the same student or if a couple people asked at once, but somebody emailed Scott and I about it. And mm-hmm. my response was same as yours. I Googled, I didn't find it. And I asked her, Hey, what did AMCAS say when you asked them directly? And her response was, I'm just going to submit all 20 schools at once. <laughs> um, and I know it can take some real energy to pump yourself up to call the double AMC. <laughs> like that's like, for me, that's sort of like when I'm calling cable, right? Like I know ultimately I'm going to get what I need, but I have to settle in for an hour of being on hold. Yeah. Um, so it like takes a certain mood. So I think she was just like, if these guys don't know, I'm just not going to risk it. So if yeah. any of you have ever found the answer to this question, please share and we'll mm-hmm. all learn it together. Yep. <laughs> if I could just put this up. Oh, look at that. Okay, there you cool. go. Thanks, McKenna. Awesome sauce. Okay. Wonderful. Jack asks, I wanted to ask about the weight ad comes put on planned activities when assessing applicants. 
Also, TMDSAS opened on May 16th. Is submitting on June 7th considered late? No, it is not. Nope. Um, so planned activities. Scott, one of the, the parts of this process that has changed this year is AMCAST now has yep. completed hours and anticipated hours. That's probably feedback from medical schools saying, hey, we're having a really hard time understanding what has been done versus what is going to be done, which tells me they want to know. Mm -hmm. TMDSAS has a future activities section. A Comus lets students update activities as they go. Um, so it seems like just looking at some of the evidence that med schools want to know what you're doing with your time and not just like, okay, I'm done with everything. I'm going to go play video games for a year. Right. That's exactly right. They want to know. And I will say that, and this isn't really as much with an activity as it is with a course. Uh, you know, they, they want to know what courses you're going to be taking over the course of the next, um, you know, academic year if you're still in school and if you, there are medical schools out there that if you say you're taking microbiology in the spring semester and you don't take microbiology, then that's going to be a problem. Uh, there are some medical schools that will hold you to that. And if you didn't do that, they're going to want to know why, why didn't you said you were going to take micro, you didn't take micro. Is there anything else in this application that you said you were going to do that you're not doing? You know, it's that kind of thing. And so those are some some of the hard nosed uh, uh, admissions officers that, that that will do that. But it is a thing. And so I would say just be be careful on the planned activities. And if, if it's something that you're planning to do, if for some reason that doesn't work out and you're not able to do it, that would be something that, you, you know, you might want to include in an update letter you know, to, uh, to, to notify the schools. Now, uh, especially if it's a course that you said you were going to take and you didn't take it because of whatever reason, uh, that would be uh, something to update them about. Yes, yes. Fresh there we go. Alec, TMDSAS, TMDSAS applicant here. Should I write about my honor code violation again in secondaries, even if I already wrote about it in the context around it in my primary in the unusual circumstances essay? So mm. um, our big philosophy here is answer the question, right? Yeah. Uh, don't throw in stuff that isn't being asked. So if there's any sort of questions that ask about this kind of stuff, write about it there. Now, potentially, let's let's go basic. And there's like a, is there anything else you want to tell us type secondary essay question? If they already talked about it in their primary on TMDSAS, do you think it's a, a, a necessary additional? Nope. Thing? No? No. Nope. Yeah. Now, I guess the question in my mind is, I don't know what... To say honor code uh, violation, that sounds a lot like Texas A&M to me. Uh, it may not be. But if it is, you know, it, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if an honor code violation may well need to fit into the uh, institutional action uh, category. So that would depend a little bit on your school and what an honor code violation means. Uh, you know, so you would want to really uh, investigate that if that needs to go as a uh, institutional action. Yeah. Ashley asks, how do schools view shadowing abroad? I shadowed a pediatrician in France for 45 hours. I just shadowed an OBGYN back in the U.S. and I'm working on finding another doctor to shadow. It's going to depend on the school. Mm -hmm. I, I know of one school specifically, I believe it's Utah, um, that specifically states they do not consider uh, shadowing abroad hours. So... Mm -hmm. You did it. Yeah, you did it. Put it on your application and med yeah. schools will do with it as they will. That's right. Mm -hmm. One more question. Yeah. So we wrap up here. Another hour. This hour goes one more for us, Veronica. <laughs> she's looking i see her down there she's looking uh sasha how does taking prereqs at other institutions other than your home university or especially abroad look to medical schools so i'll, I'll answer the abroad one first uh 
don't do prereqs abroad. No, 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 um, no. So, yep. so you don't want to do that. Other than your home institution. So we have been participating in a lot of parent groups uh, on Facebook and the overwhelming kind of scare tactic that is out there is only take prereqs at the one institution. Do not take them anywhere else. The med schools don't like that. Don't do it. And I'm just like, is it really that black and white, Scott? I don't, I don't understand. No, I, it's not black and white. It's, you know, it, it, as with so many other things in the application, it depends. Yeah. Uh, you know, it depends on what other institution you're, you're, you're taking it at. I would not recommend that you're at university and you take in the summer, you go to community college and take, you know, organic chemistry or, uh, or, or whatever. I, I don't recommend that. Uh, I would say, um, you know, you, you have to kind of, um, you know, do things if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to save money, which is sometimes a reason uh, why you might do that, you're going to go to a cheaper institution and take, you know, take a class in the summer, for example, or whatever. Uh, and, and I totally get that. Uh, but, uh, you know, just be careful with where you're, where you're going to, where you're taking these classes and uh, uh, make sure that in, if it came up, for example, in an interview, uh, where an interviewer would say, hey, I see that you took, uh, you know, physics at X school, but you're really a student at Y school. You know, tell me a little bit about that, that you have a, a reasonably good explanation for it. Yeah. yeah. There are lots of reasons. Yeah. Um, and, and Scott, as you, you kind of categorize uh, optimal, acceptable, mm -hmm. right. and uh, whatever your unacceptable, unacceptable yeah. level. Yeah. Um, right. The optimal is, hey, all of your your prereqs are at four year institutions, maybe yeah. not the same exact one. Um, acceptable for a lot of people is community college. Yeah, there was absolutely. there was a question. One of the parents was like, hey, my my kid graduated, but um, decided to be pre-med a little bit later. They graduated already, but still has two prereqs. Can they do it at a community college? And it's probably fine, yeah. assuming they have good grades and they're, yeah. it doesn't look like they're trying to to avoid harder classes at community college. I think there's still a lot of big stigma on community college, even though a lot of community college professors are the university professors mm -hmm. that are just yes. moonlighting at the community college. Yes. That is so true. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, also, uh, one of the pre-meds we're working with currently is in community college. As she pointed out, it's often easier to get letters of rec there because the student to professor ratio mm -hmm. tends to be really low. So instead of 500 in your Gen Chem lecture, it might be 25 in a Gen Chem classroom. So you actually get to know your professor. Mm -hmm. um, there are some perks. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. absolutely. So uh, we should update this little banner here. So this is 30 days free to try MapDap Pro oh, yeah. uh, at mapped.com. Most of the features, if you've been watching us for a while, most of the features of Mapped App, as, as we've uh, grown and iterated and learned more about what students want and how they're using it, a lot of Mapped App is free. Um, mm -hmm. Track your activities, track your courses, look up med schools. Um, and the more that we're adding into Mapped App, the more we, we're trying to leave on the free tier. And we have lots of fun, exciting things uh, for the pro tier as well, which is the paid tier. <laughs> Right. So oh. there's free forever, which has tons of good stuff. And you can also get a free trial of the map pro. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right, everyone. It is time. Another ask the Dean in the books, Dr. Scott Wright, Verinia Granham, Rachel Grubbs, and myself, Ryan Gray. We thank you for being here today. Um, letting us be a part of your journey to medical school or wherever you are going. So, have a wonderful day. We'll see you now, not next week, maybe. Well, uh, Verena and Rachel, Verena. yeah, you can, I'll just do it next you week. Hold yeah. down. Sure. Um, for those of you in the Denver area, uh, or if you can make it to Denver, the National Association of Advisors of, of Health Professions is having their national conference in Denver. There is a pre health fair on Saturday, the 18th. Um, if you can make it, we will be there. We're also doing a meetup on Saturday night yep. um, for some pre-meds. We haven't fully announced that yet, so stay tuned for that. Woohoo! All right, everyone. See you later. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.